anything requires commitment. Continuous learning is the process of acquiring new skills and knowledge continually over time or upskilling. This helps us to develop both personally and professionally. Hello everybody, I am Seema Choria and I welcome you all to another insightful session on great principles. Joining me today in conversation is my eternal learner educator of the day, Mr. Alan Anderson, Director, Chavan Bharatiya School, Bharatiya City, Bangalore. Welcome to Great Principles, sir. It's truly an honor to have you today. It's an honor to be here. Thank you very much. So, sir, let me start where your journey of long 47 years started. At the age of 19 years itself, when you were a student, you started teaching to pay for your higher studies. And after these 47 years of uh, hard work and commitment, today you are a renowned expert of education across the globe. So tell me, according to you, what is your definition of educators as change makers? Educators make changes through others, through their students. So what educators can and should do is to create learning experiences and learning environments where the learners can um, adapt to the world they live in, where they can get the competences uh, and the personal qualities to thrive in a fast-changing world. But I think it's important that educators understand that they can't do the trick. Learning must take place in the learner, but as educators we have a very crucial role to play in, in organizing learning experiences that are vital uh, for the learners and that's a very meaningful job to have absolutely so so here i would like to ask you one more thing you know unfortunately our schools majorly the schools here in our country we are more focused on just providing literacy we are not actually educating the children so what are your thoughts on this how can this be changed it's not only happening happening in India, it, it's happening in many places of the world. But I think one of the things I take with me from Denmark, from Scandinavia, is the holistic approach to children. That is ingrained in everything we do from KG to universities in Denmark. So whenever there is a learning process going on with academic uh, objectives, there ought to be uh, learning objectives for developing uh, social and emotional skills and values. Um, and I think many schools have taken important steps now. And I also think that the fact that we have had nearly two years with online only teaching in many schools makes it very clear to educators that something important is lacking. It's also lacking in normal school days in most schools, but now it has become very visible to everyone. And I think these, uh, uh, these learning objectives uh, within social and emotional uh, uh, competences are there in the new education policy in India. So I think an important step for all Indian states and all Indian schools would be to change the curriculum and not the least change the way we test students and the way we organize entry exams for university so that it's clear that we want to develop whole personalities. I talk about citizenship uh, because I think that is the important thing to develop in children. Children who want to do something for their community, it can be the local community, it can be the country, it can also be the planet. Um, but but uh, citizenship is, for me, the reason why we have education. And citizens are not only academics. Uh, I, I, I used to say that we want to develop both uh, the right and the, uh, and, and the left side of the brain. Uh, and, and schools are traditionally very focused on left side activities. But in work life and in society, in every community, uh, we need an, uh, holistic personalities 
We need people who know who they are, where they come from, what values they stand for, how to reach out to other people and create solutions in collaboration with other people. Um, and schools can play a, a crucial role. So when we now discuss what can we take away from uh, the two years of online learning, many people talk about hybrid school models and that's very crucial too. We, we can use online uh, elements much more intelligent than we have done so far. But maybe the most crucial takeaway from online uh, learning is the importance of human interaction. That children are with grown-ups, not only their parents, and that they are part of a group, of a, a community of, of, of equal, equals. Um, so we, we should not just go back to the old way of having school. We should say, okay, after COVID, what can we see the children really needs? And instead of talking so much about the academic gap, we should talk more about the emotional gap after uh, the school lockdowns. Certainly, sir. You know, we all could see that how children actually became silent all of a once, all of a sudden due to pandemic. They were not interacting much, neither with the families. They were not very participative in any of the family activities also. There was some kind of sadness in them. And you rightly said yeah. that schools is not only about academics. It's also about the emotional well-being of the children. So, sir. And basically, we are social human beings. We are social sir. creatures. So we, we, we don't develop in a vacuum. We develop with other people. Certainly, sir. And it's pro proven that, you know, the peer kind of education is the best form of education. A child learns best through his peers. So, you know, he was lacking there also. And you rightly said that human interaction, human touch is very much required. So, sir, your current school, your director at Chaman Bhartiya School and Chaman Bhartiya School says that they are makers of leaders. So how are you creating leaders? I would like to know about it. Yeah. First of, of all, I would say that we talk about leadership, uh, but we have a very broad understanding of, of the concept leadership. Um, it's basically uh, young people who are, as a basis, leaders in their own life. Uh, people who believe in themselves, who can, who can take decisions and who can interact with others to create solutions. Um, so what, what we are doing is whenever we have academic activities, we ensure that there is a, an element of, of developing the leadership qualities. And we have developed five basic leadership pillars, as we call them, learning to live. That is basically learning to know who you are, where you come from, what values you have, to be a character, learning to live together, that is the empathy side of a personality. Learning to act, that is to have courage to do something without being sure that you will succeed, but you will have the self-confidence that makes you think, okay, I can do it. I have tried it, but naturally I can do it. And then the fourth pillar is learning uh, to learn because we believe that this flexible attitude to life where you know that you never reach the final stage of your life. Uh, you have to learn, especially as the climate change progresses. We know that societies will, will change and we will all need to learn more. Maybe not so much me, but uh, the, the children I educate at least. And then learning to lead, that is to take action, to, uh, to find solution in cooperation with others. So we say in all our academic activities in math and physics in English and social studies, there must be an element where you can say you develop at least one of these qualities. And in the report cards we create, we have a section about how the child develops in these areas. We, um, we don't want them to be alike. So everyone needs to find his or her own way um, but we think it's crucial that it's part of all academic activities that there is some development of the personal qualities and we call it leadership because we think that if we can create
personalities with those qualities, they will be able to do something extraordinary wherever they are. They might not be CEOs in a big com company, that's not what we're aiming at, but wherever they are, they can take initiative, they can come up with proposals, they can find solutions for difficult problems. So that's how we understand leadership. So, so it's absolutely not a, 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 a business school that uh, we are developing. It's basic human leadership of yourself and your relationship to others. Wow. Today I got to know an altogether different angle of leadership and I really love the point where you mentioned that it's about human leadership. That is what is required for our children today. They need to be proactive, you know. They have to be the proactive thinkers and I really mm. love this concept of making every learner a leader. This is such a beautiful vision that you have and I'm sure if this kind of vision is followed in every school, you know, there will be a change in how the children react to situations, how well they have control on their thoughts. I really love this uh, vision and I'm sure many educators will uh, learn this from this uh, interview today. So moving ahead to my next question, sir, you were uh, talking about that how our children need to be responsible for the planet also and we need to have a citizenship and some kind of planetary citizenship also. So tell me something, sir, are, are today's educators of the society, are they skilled to teach, coach and lead the children to become a planetary citizen? No, the, the short answer is, of course, no. Um, but I think that's not what is interesting, really, because uh, schools are never perfect. Uh, teachers are never perfect. So as a leader of a school, I, I see it as my task to create a learning community who want to know more who want to develop new methods of teaching that, that, is, uh, that fits modern children and uh, the state of the earth. Um, so what, what we do here is not, uh, we are not, we're not starting with the perfect teacher or the perfect student. We say we are here, we have these teachers, we have these children, we know that the planet is burning, we know we have, we have the UN Sustainable Development Goal. So how can we, gradually bring uh, that thinking about sustainability into the minds of our children by letting them do projects where sustainability is an element. Um, and, and by having what we call problem-based learning, that is learning where, where the students work to solve real-life problems uh, for people outside the school, sometimes also inside the school, but when, when students become change makers and problem solvers and, and do projects, they will become specialists in area where the teachers are not specialists. Uh, the teachers will not be uh, taught in wage, uh, waste management in Bengaluru, but some of the children work uh, on how to, to find good solution for waste management in, in Bengaluru. Um, so in that way, by, by starting the process, by creating um, uh, uh, learning experiences where we ask the children to, to define a problem and find solutions for that problem, the children and the teachers will develop gradually. Uh, so what we have been looking for in our teachers in, in the um, employment process and re recruitment process it's not teachers who, who could say yes to all the elements of our vision. We want teachers who have an open mindset, who are curious, who want to learn more, and who want to do it with their colleagues. And we are satisfied with taking small steps. Big steps usually uh, are usually no steps. Um, so by taking with a pragmatic approach, small steps in the right direction, uh, we are gradually getting there. So the answer to your question is also yes, if we get teachers with the mindset of change, with the mindset of learning with the children, uh, then Indian teachers are absolutely capable of doing it. We did problem-based learning already in an online setting last year, and we are, we are doing it 
right now and we are at the end of a, a project. Um, so I can see that the teachers can do it, but if I had asked them one year, uh, one and a half year, years ago, what is problem-based learning and do you want to do it? Uh, they, they hardly knew the concept. So you, you, you can create change by creating what I call learning communities in schools. So I think that is the most crucial task for a school leader today, to create these learning communities. In the traditional thinking, you can say, okay, now we can see we need to know more about uh, problem-based learning, so therefore you invite an expert, and he goes through 79 slides about problem-based learning, and after the seminar, nothing happens, because it's not directly connected to the daily needs of the teachers. Um, so, so some of the discussions we have in the school might not sound so big and theoretical, but they are discussions that are necessary for our teachers to actually do what we want to do. And I'm satisfied with the steps we have taken so far. Absolutely, sir. I completely agree with you that, you know, there has to be a mindset. When pandemic left no option, everyone just, you know, get up and started using the technology and became the problem solver here and managed to keep the learning going on. But here, sir, we yeah. have one more challenge, you know. Our children are glued to screen. This is the era of digital, you know, this is the digital age. So in, to these children, those who know the glow of screen better than the glow of sun, how would you develop love for nature so that they can have the sustainable goals in their life also? Yeah, they, they still, still need to go there. So, so we are in one sense very digital. All our learners have an iPad and I think technology is crucial to have inquiry-based learning and personalized learning. So study trips to, to farms, to, to, to uh, uh, nature parks and, and whatever is very crucial. So I think in, in our daily activities, uh, we are still very physical and analog, but all the time we have the iPad with us. So if we need to know something, we can find it on the iPad. If we need to take a picture, we can do that. So we have all our tools with us, but our, our topic is the world as it exists as a physical entity. Um, so this balance between uh, physical learning and, and digital learning is very hard to find. And therefore, I have said from the beginning, uh, we don't want to be an online school. I don't believe in online only education for small children from three to, to 18 years old. Uh, universities uh, must speak for themselves, but I know about uh, early years and primary and secondary school. Um, because the human interaction is so important and the interaction with physical things, to create phys physical things is so crucial for learning. Um, so, so we were only online because that was the best bad option. Um, so I could see that we couldn't open the school. So even, even if we haven't, hadn't seen our children, we decided to open as an online school. Um, so on one side, I have been surprised to see how much could actually happen online. Um, but now that we have the children back, it's very visible. Uh, how much we also have missed and how they have missed to develop together. So it has made me even more sure about um, uh, interacting with other people and with the, the physical world. I can say I was maybe the leader of the first school in the world that had only digital learning material. In my last high school, I founded in Copenhagen in 2005. From 2007, we were uh, not an online school, but our teaching materials were organized and provided digitally. So I have many years of experiences with 
digital teaching and learning. And therefore, I know all the dangers. But my view on it is it's, it must be regulated in schools and in families. But if we don't train the, the student with uh, digital education, digit, digit, digital ethics, digit, good digital habits, it will never happen. If you look at the parent generation, how they use their phone and uh, digital gadgets, the children keep complaining that they never they can never talk to their parents. They are on on uh, some kind of gadget all the time. So we try to invite the gadgets into the school environment, but also have discussions about how is the right way to use it, what is digital bullying, and so on and so forth. So we are not naive. We know the dangers that are out there. But if we don't have digital gadgets in the school, we are not preparing for the 21st century. Absolutely, sir. I agree with you. Technology is imperative for, for, in education now. And uh, we cannot deny the fact that with digital advancement, children would learn better. But, you know, I, I think I can agree more on the point where you mentioned that. Go to the nature walks, have your iPad with you, note down the things that are worthy of noting, which you would like to remember again. So that is how you blend. And you, as you rightly said, you know, you need to find the perfect balance between the physical learning and the technological learning. Mm. And that is how the children will understand better. The visits that you mentioned, the farm visit, the nature trails, the nature walks, this is required, you know, when a child senses the nature around him, that is when he becomes more active towards preserving it, towards conservating it. So th this is the whole uh, thought behind it. So I think I, uh, I completely agree with the answer and you beautifully shared that there are both the aspects of it, but we need to find the perfect balance. So moving ahead to the next question, sir, you have a long journey and uh, you know you have moved across from many places. So I would like to know from you some of the starry moments or anecdotes from your journey as an educator. I could, I could start with one thing, and that is when I went to the university in the 70s, at that time we were already talking about problem-based learning. We were talking about the need for the change in education. So in some ways, I've come back to where I started. Uh, of course, the world is different, but there's still a need to change the academic format of education, both in, in preschool, in primary and secondary school, and at universities. At all levels, I see the need to change in a more experimental and inquiry-based direction. And that's where I started in 1974. My first teacher training in the school while I was teaching was about problem-based learning. Um, another thing I will, I will mention is that my background is very much in uh, vocational schools. The first nearly 20 years of my career was in vocational school. And in Denmark, we have a parallel system. You can go to the academic high school or you can go to a vocational school where some of the teaching takes place in a company. And one of the schools I uh, created, uh, I was a founder of, was a school for assistant nurses. That is, people who go to people's home and help them with their uh, sick. We have a big system for that in Denmark. Um, so I went into to that school without having any knowledge about nursing, but I knew about learning and teaching and to lead a school. So, so that, that was one important milestone. Then I was the first vocational teacher and leader to become a high school uh, principal in Denmark. And that was, that was perceived as, as much, having much higher status than vocational schools. So when I started as a principal in a village in Denmark, the colleagues on the island, 12 of them, um, went to the government and protested because they didn't think that I was equipped to lead an academic high school. When I left that school five years 
after they were all celebrated me and said how good I was. But uh, when I, I joined, um, they didn't think I was equipped for that. But I, I think that also says something about my mentality that I want to try new things. And I, I never trust that I can't do it. So I, I believe that uh, if I don't have the competences, at least I can develop the competences needed. The last uh, milestone I will mention is uh, the school I, I founded in Copenhagen, the Berestad uh, High School with a very beautiful building. And it was planned uh, in the municipality of Copenhagen, in the city of Copenhagen, to be an innovative school. So we had high level of technology, open learning spaces, uh, much collaboration and project-based learning. And that school became a member of the Ashoka Changemaker School Network, which was also an, a, a crucial step for us and, and for me personally. Uh, we had another network uh, called Global Schools Alliance. And uh, in that network, uh, that the initiative was taken uh, from Vega schools in Bourgogne. Uh, and uh, I had visited that school uh, several times. So when I got the job offer here in India uh, from Mr. Agarwal in the Bhatia company, um, I, I knew a little bit about India. We also had a partner school in India, step-by-step -step school in Noida. So I wasn't afraid to take the step from Denmark to India, even though I'm, I'm old and very, very experienced. Um, so, so that, that, that are some of, of the milestones uh, of my career. So I've been in education all my life, but in, in different uh, places. But always at least five years every, in every school. I think so. The entire journey and all the memories that you share signifies one thing, that if you want to receive anything, that you, then you need to believe in it. And you rightly said that you just kept on... Uh, experimenting and you were never afraid of taking up anything which is new so you know that is what we need to learn each one of us that you know life has many opportunities are we ready to take it up and we need to believe in ourselves first so I think your journey taught me this today that even at this age when you are not afraid of changing your national you know moving to the other country which you are not aware there is so much for me to do so I, I need to learn so much from you. And this is, I have taken a lot from your journey, sir. On this beautiful learning, I have reached to the very important segment of the show, which is called rapid fire round. So, sir, you have to answer in one word or a statement would do. All right. So here okay. comes my very, all right. So here comes my very first question to you. What are your hobbies? How do you spend your recreational time? I, I run. I read, I listen to music, and now I FaceTime with my family. All right. So, coming up to the next question. If you were to describe the importance of music in one word, what would that word be? I think it would be journey. That listening to music takes you into a world not of words but of sounds you can create your own images um, so it's also time for reflection now i'm talking very much about i listen to all kind of music but but the greatest journey for me is classical european music it's very long so sometimes it's a six hour journey and i enjoy it very much all right, coming up to my next question. What is your exercise, you know, is exercising a routine affair for you? Yeah, I try to make it a routine affair. Uh, so I, I, will, I will do 35 to 40 minutes of exercise six days a week. So either I go to a lake and take a run in the morning or I go to... Uh, uh, to to uh, a fitness center and and do exercises, but uh, I can feel when I don't do it. So it's a completely different start of uh, on a day when I've had my run compared to 
to uh, not doing it. But one thing I will say, and that's not to brag, but uh, in my high age, I am the fastest runner at the lake and I shouldn't be that. But I think there's a lot to do for Indians when it comes to exercising. And therefore in our school, we want the children to, to uh, move around a lot and to, to do at least uh, 30 minutes of physical exercise every day. So you are certainly an inspiration to many when you mentioned that, you know, that you can run faster than many of the people there in the lake, at the lake. So this is, you know, something that we all need to learn from you. And I think you very beautifully also shared one more thing that, you know, physical activity should be the part of a regular school regime. You know, our school children need to have this physical activity. And I will not deny this, that yes, in India, awareness towards health exercise is a little less and people are not very focused on it. Though I can see a little change coming in when people are nearing... The change is suddenly, coming. I can feel yeah, that too. Suddenly, you know, people get, wake up. All right, now I'm in my 40s. I need to exercise. <laughs> so mm. let's hope that it starts from, from an early age. Coming up to the next question, sir. You are an avid reader. So which is your favorite book and author? I can't say that I, I have any specific, specific favorites. I, I read a lot of of fiction, both Danish, German, English, and Indian fiction, Indian fiction in, in English. I also read a lot of uh, non-fiction uh, about politics and, and history. Um, and I, I read four newspapers every day and two, three weekly magazines. So, I try to be updated also on everything that happens in, in India, which is not so easy to understand for, for an outsider, um, but I try. Um, so, so I always have two, two or three books that uh, I read, but I will say one thing and that is I, I, I have an eye disease. So it's very hard for me to read nowadays. So most of what I do is, is uh, audio. So either audio books or electronic reading on my, uh, my, my iPad. So, so even though I can't read much, I can only read a few lines and I, it's blurry for me. I can, I can still read because of, of, the, of the new technology. Um, so, so therefore I know that even children in school who has difficulties in reading, there are so many technologies out there that can help them. So if you are dyslectic, okay, you can get the text read by uh, in an audio book or by your electronic reader on, on the iPad, because I have my own experience with that. I have been reading since I was six years old, so it would be very bad for me if I couldn't continue that. Um, but so. through our audio books, I can. Yeah, I think so. You know, it's the will that I want to do something. Then you find out the ways. Like you said, yeah. you know, that you, in technology, you find out the ways to just, you know, go, just surpass your ailment also and continue reading. So my last question to you in this section is, you are an avid reader, you love reading, but how do we develop this love for reading in our children, which is an essential activity? Yeah, that's something uh, we discuss. And we have what we call a joy of reading program in the school. We can develop it even further. But the idea is that there should be, every child should have a reading going on with a book that they are passionate about. So instead of saying it should be an academic textbook, if they like horses and read a book about ponies, that will also train their reading capacity capability because if they first find out the richness that reading gives they can't not do it but until they have that experience internet is always more entertaining and easy uh, to go to so therefore it needs to be part of the school's uh, tasks but but i think it's it's crucial to do it in two ways both the conventional academic way where where you read textbooks and uh, and whatever but also the the engaging way where you let them have the joy of reading uh, so so that's in, in integrated in our in our school 
you know there are so many things to learn from you and so many ways in which we can make learning more joyful so so before we just sign off there is one last thing i would like to know now you have like seen education evolving so if i ask you that what would be that thing from education for the children if you would supposed to bring from past what would that be and if one thing you were given to change for this generation what would that be? what i would like to take with me from when i went to high school myself is um the engagement in academic problems in high school i had uh, my languages were ancient greek and latin and russian and not that i still use it but i learned so much about cultures Uh, through these subjects and uh, my uh, greek teacher came to me with a german book and said i i didn't have german as a, as a subject uh, try to read this book das glasperlenspiel von hermann hesse that's something for you and he trusted that i could do it even though i i i didn't have german as a subject so this this engagement in academics i saw in uh, very much in my class i would like to take that with me um the other th- side i i i really would would want to to change is the tendency to to rote learning to learn because of tests and not because it's valuable um and therefore uh, it it's so crucial that i heard from a university in singapore they had stopped uh, taking students uh, based on marks they had interviews and looked at student portfolios to ensure that they had the right mindset for learning that they wanted to learn not only to get a good uh, diploma with uh, five fine marks so that's what we are trying here to 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 develop that engagement in children not to lose on academics i'm not talking about that but to come to academics through engagement and 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 joy yeah that Wonderful, that would sir. be my answer wonderful sir and this was really lovely to know because even i am of the same opinion that it's high time that we all need to go away with rote learning it's of no use you know it's just because of this rote learning we are just running behind the marks and are seeing that our children are not capable and that is what is no, and then when they work they are not efficient enough they are not skilled enough and then industry suffers and ultimately the nation suffers because of this one thing that we are not practicing at school that is going away with rote learning so so before you know i think I, there is one more thing i want to ask you i i always say that before i sign off now because you know I, in a little while i'll know you that you are a person who is always learning something you are already master so many things now is there any other activity that you are keen on pursuing no i think i have uh, enough uh, just just adapting uh, to india to understand india um and to get to know so much about the country as possible now it has not been possible to travel so much as i would want to so now i'll start doing it again i've traveled a lot in karnataka but i would like to to know more about other parts of india and one thing that is very strange for me is hinduism i grew up uh, in a christian family my father was a christian priest so everything in hinduism is so different from the christian culture i grew up with after 4 years here in india i understand more and more but still it is very strange to me so i think for me for the coming years to to be in india to, uh, to know more about india uh, that, that that is what what i want to do and some of my people in the organization say that i'm more indian than they are but that's not true but it's true that i try to get as much knowledge as i can so maybe i read more indian newspapers than than most people do because i really want to understand politics in india indian history
right? So, you know, and that is the wonderful thing to do. You know, you, wherever you are, you need to understand the people, the culture, <clears throat> what is going on, how are the things there. So then only you can be a part of the community and serve the community yeah. well. So that is what yeah. is required for every leaders. So, sir, I think I've taken a lot of your time, but it's so interesting to talk to you that I can just go on and on and on. And there's <laughs> so much to learn from you, but I need to stop here. So, sir, so, you know, educators like you have carried out this global responsibility competently of, uh, you know, preparing for foresightedness. And you are personified role model to many aspiring academician out there. I really feel blessed and privileged to have heard your wise word and appreciate your time with us. Thank you so very much. And thank you so very much. It was a pleasure to be here.